Well, I'm delighted to be here tonight and share a little bit of the background of the mural project at camp and also an interpretation and a survey of the uh, pictures. <clears throat> In 1944, Medford Near was invited to uh, Camp Mac as a teacher of a special interest class on art appreciation. Medford, as you may know, had been a pastor for many years and also a professional artist. And uh, it was great to have him at Camp Mac teaching art appreciation. And he brought his paints and brushes with him. And any camper who wanted to experiment and practice with painting, he'd be glad to share some advice with them. Well, my girlfriend at the time was quite interested in art. And I was quite interested in my girlfriend, so we both spent a lot of time with uh, Medford. And during the course of our visit, my wife doesn't mind me talking about my first girlfriend because she's it. <clears throat> so that clears that question up. Uh, during our conversations with Medford, he uh, described to us his dream of painting a mural history of the Church of the Brethren. This was 1944. Medford had been a, an evangelist. He had been in churches all across the country. And every place he went to hold meetings, he would, uh, if they wanted to, he'd paint a picture on the walls. Maybe you've seen a lot of these earlier churches with these beautiful paintings back of the pulpit area or above the baptistry. Uh, you may know of some paintings that Medford himself actually painted. So he did paint quite a lot of uh, stuff. But his dream was to paint the history of the Church of the Brethren. He didn't know where he'd go with it. He couldn't quite get started. He had done a lot of research, particularly research about the techniques of mural painting. He had studied some of the great mural painters of Europe. Well, as we talked about it, I got pretty enthused and Eloise got pretty enthused about this project. And we talked and talked about it. He had in mind that the paintings would be somewhere around two-thirds life size, maybe five feet by 15, something like that. He hadn't actually painted anything yet. He'd just been dreaming about it. And um, we wondered if maybe the young people of the Camp Mac area, at that time Camp Mac was the official camp of all three of the districts of Indiana plus northwestern Ohio. I happened to be president of the Camp Mac Young People's Organization and my girlfriend was secretary so we kind of had it sewed up wouldn't you think? Anyhow, we talked about this project and what would we do with them, where would we put them. <clears throat> One idea which didn't get very far, we thought that these huge paintings could become portable and that we take a great big truck like the giant red Brethren service trucks. Remember those old 18-wheelers? We thought maybe their time would come that we could move these pictures around to district meetings, to annual conference, to colleges, whatever. Well, I still think that was a good idea, but it didn't work out that way. Anyhow, we ended up <clears throat> deciding to see if the young people would support the project to put them in the Quinter Miller Auditorium at Camp Mac. Well, you know most of the rest of the history. <clears throat> The young people's camp there that week enthusiastically adopted the project. <clears throat> I became sort of the promoter, uh, sent letters to young people's groups all over the area supported by camp, tried to raise money. Some of the original documents I have on display over here on the table, you might want to see what some of those early promotional pieces looked like. 
The medium of choice was the mimeograph machine. Do you remember the mimeograph machine? <laughs> Seems just like yesterday, doesn't it? Uh, everything was done by mimeograph then. Uh, much of the literature that I distributed, uh, sample copies there. In the meantime, Medford rushed right home after camp and began to work on the first section of the mural. He didn't have a piece of canvas big enough for the whole mural, so he took two smaller pieces and glued them together. If you look carefully, the first panel, there's a seam uh, about two-thirds of the way through it where there were two pieces of canvas put together. He uh, wrote out on a piece of paper uh, what was going to go in this first panel. All of the items that he was going to put in, including lots of symbolism, uh, images faint and vague, but still a part of the story as well as the main characters. Uh, he took this project so seriously that he resigned his full-time pastorate at Defiance and took a part-time pastorate at uh, Poplar Ridge, is it? Not far from Defiance. Poplar Ridge. Um, so he went from a full-time pastor to a part-time pastor. He still lived in Defiance. And he found an empty building, an empty garage on the college campus that he set up for his painting studio, and he started to work. We had at, camp, at, uh, at the college, Eloise and I were just enrolling as freshmen at the college that year, we had what was known as the regional, the Central Region Pastors Conference, which then eventually became the Central Regional Conference. And we had arranged for Medford to bring, if he could get it done in time, bring that painting to Manchester College, and we would put it on display for those pastors. This would be the first exposure of anybody to the painting. And I hadn't seen it either. And I can still remember Medford driving up in his old car, parked there alongside what's now the Wampler Auditorium at the west end of the ad building. You folks that know the college know where I'm talking about. And I can see him getting into the back seat of his car and bringing out a big roll of canvas. He had that painting all rolled up like this. And in the Wampler Auditorium, he put up a simple wooden frame, tacked the picture to it, and there it was on display to the public for the first time. This was in October, near the beginning of October in 1944. That's the first time anybody had seen it, and the first time most people ever heard about the mural project. Well, I made sure they got several mimeographed pieces at, at that meeting, I took a picture of the first section of the mural and made copies of it, a small size and a little larger size. I've got them over there on the table for display. The small size picture, I asked 35 cents for it, and the bigger size, I got 50 cents. And I kept a record of who all bought pictures and, well, of course, that didn't make much money, but it sure got the word around about what the project was going to be like. And it introduced the project to some of the big-time leaders of the Church of the Brethren in this central region. Medford had committed himself wholeheartedly to this project. And it was soon after camp in around August of 1944 he wrote me this letter. My dear William, my heart is stirred within me at the wonderful opportunity you and I have to help all the young people of our region to a deeper life in Christ and a steady loyalty to a great church. With much love, Medford. 
And for the next four years, he poured his life into these paintings in a very real way. Now, as I mentioned, he studied the techniques of mural painting from the great painters of Europe. And uh, part of his commitment to painting murals, the style of a mural, uh, that we can see illustrated very well in this first panel. A mural is like a book. It tells a story. And like a book, the mural is divided into sections. In this case, 12 sections, 12 chapters, if you please. There is a continuity, a thread of continuity from one panel to the next, like one chapter to another. Just like one chapter of a book doesn't tell you the whole story, one panel of the mural doesn't tell you the whole story. The mural is filled with symbolism. Symbols to an artist are like metaphors, figures of speech to a writer. Remember that parallel. As you look at a historical mural, you see images and figures that are clearly historical. Then you see other images that are kind of vague and in the background and that are symbolic of something and maybe do not represent real historic characters. To tie all 12 scenes together, at the top of each painting he has these large white wings representing, I suppose, uh, the wings of the Holy Spirit, the protective angel, whatever symbolism you want to give to it. Those are in every picture. At the bottom of the picture, just sort of some editorial guidelines. In this case, the date of the particular section and some kind of a heading for each uh, section. You will notice that there are two kinds of figures, like actors on a stage. The real live characters are toward the front of the stage and you can see them in this painting as if they were real people. And almost all of these characters can be identified by name. But in the backdrop, the background, are all of these symbolic uh, figures. I liken it again to a stage production where there's the back of the stage with some scenery painted on it. Then you have these drops that come down from up above, you know, to set different scenes on the same stage. And sometimes these backdrops are on several different levels. We can identify in some of these cases figures that are closer to the front and other figures that seem to be a little bit farther back and still other images that seem to be still further back. But the the figures of the real persons uh, are very obvious. Um, the first setting starts at 1708 in Schwarzenau. Now the story of the brethren goes back a bit earlier than that. You remember this is 1944, long before Don Dernball began his extensive research in Germany and did not have the benefit at all of the latest research by Marcus Meyer, which is to be published perhaps next spring before a conference time. So this represents pretty much the level of our understanding of Brethren history as it was in 1944. He begins the scene with Alexander Mack uh, leading the group of eight people. Mac's wife, Margarita. Uh, the others are all named. If you get a hold of these books of the mural, you can uh, find the names of all of these people. Uh, symbolically, with the Bible at the center of their study. And you can see Mac pointing with his finger to something in the scripture. 
Yes, indeed, I understand this. This is what we must believe. Can you see his finger pointing it out there? And uh, uh, the lady to the left, uh, renouncing the old church ways, and the brother to the right, uh, with his hand pointing out in this direction, every gesture in the mural painting has some significance. What's to stop us? Let's get on with us. We understand all this. We agree to it. Let's get on with us. Let's get on with the baptism. And uh, the middle scene then shows the group in the Ader River being baptized. Somebody baptized Mac. We don't know who. He in turn baptized the others. Uh, the figure of Mac's wife. Uh, as a kind of a mother figure to the whole uh, little cluster of people, Mac baptizing one of the members. Notice two ripples in the water, and he's about to be immersed the third time to create the third ripple. So many of these little nuances you just wouldn't notice. We wouldn't have known it if Medford hadn't have pointed that out to us. In the background, symbolically, are some other churches that resulted from this first baptism, two or three or four other congregations in different parts of Germany grew out of this uh, first baptism. Uh, <clears throat> Peter Becker was the head of a group of brethren at Crayfelt. Alexander Mack stayed with the congregation at Schwarzenau. In Crayfelt, there was a little disagreement among the brethren, and in 1719, Peter Becker took a number of the families and uh, uh, sailed off toward Germantown. In the background is Peter Becker's ship coming to America. And in the meantime, Alexander Mack had moved a large congregation from Schwarzenau up to Holland. And uh, persecution got so pressing, see the black clouds of persecution hanging over them. And so in 1729, here is Mac and his three sons. His wife and two daughters had died while they were living in Holland. And in 1729, they were ready to board this ship to sail to Germantown. Fast forward now, or backwards if we want to say that, to 1719, when Peter Becker and his group uh, landed in Germantown, they spread out over a wide area. You see, uh, to migrate to a strange foreign land was hard enough, but then to try to make a living, establish a home, that was a full-time job. So they spread out over the uh, countryside, uh, established homes, many places, and they really weren't in touch or contact with each other. Uh, this again shows Peter Becker uh, coming up with his group. Peter Becker was rather well-to-do. A number of these early brethren were certainly middle class at, at that time. Um, maybe you've noticed how brightly colored their clothing was. Medford researched it and found out that that was the standard middle class, upper middle class clothing. There was no unique religious uh, emphasis on a particular style of dress. Uh, they all dressed like everybody else did at that time. Uh, after about four years, these brethren, a few of them, gathered around Germantown and uh, figured we ought to get in touch with the rest of them. And so uh, in 1722 and 23, they, uh, a bunch of them got together, and uh, they had an organization. They had not been organized before. There was no church in Germantown or in America up to that point. And they elected... Peter Becker as their leader, in other words, the moderator, the elder, and uh, after intense Bible study, uh, 
and uh, there were six more people joining them that weren't part of the original group. Uh, the most prominent of these men later became uh, pretty well known, Martin Erner, U-R-N-E-R. -E so six newcomers plus 17 of the original group decided to officially organize. Now organizing a Church of the Brethren back then was pretty simple. All you did was elect an elder. That was it. As you needed ministers, you called more people to the ministry. Uh, they had no boards, no committees, no budgets, no church services, no church building. It was a pretty simple matter. And they set about arranging for the baptism of these six new members in the Wissahickon Creek in what's now Philadelphia. Back then it was way out in the country. Wissahickon. I'll give you an A if you can spell that on an examination. Wissa. I can't spell it without looking it up. Tradition has it this was at Christmas Day. Water pretty chilly. The brethren for a long time didn't take the temperature of the water before they decided to have a baptism. <laughs> and uh, you may know of people or maybe you yourself have been baptized outdoors when it was pretty cool. And I remember hearing stories of places they had to chop through the ice to have a baptism. That was back in the early days. Uh, they also had what was called the first love feast in the Brethren. Now even though in terms of the mural he would have called this the Church of the Brethren, we all know it was the original Brethren group. They had not yet divided into different... Uh, uh, subgroupings. So uh, the first third or so of the mural is the history of all of us. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so this becomes the first full-fledged love feast ever held in America. The first baptism by trying immersion. The first of a lot of things because there had not been any brethren here before. In this meeting in 1723, they decided that they'd better go out and meet with a lot of other German-type immigrants to see if they would be interested in being part of this church. So in the background, in a vague, fuzzy, symbolic presentation, are men walking and men on horseback starting out for the first missionary journey in America. And here we see, beginning in 1724, this band of 14 men setting out to uh, travel amongst the German pioneers uh, to uh, see if they would be interested in becoming uh, part of, a, of their church fellowship. As a result of uh, this journey, they met with dozens of German pioneers and uh, had some conversions. And out of this journey came new congregations. The second church to be established was at Coventry. And the third one was at Conestoga. And in the next few decades, there were about 15 to 20 congregations of German Baptist in that particular area of Pennsylvania. And they had love feast. From the very beginning, the love feast was the ultimate service for German Baptists to participate in. They didn't have regular preaching. They didn't have services of any other kind. But the love feast, once a year, twice a year, became the ultimate and most important service that the German Baptists could participate in. And that practice has continued to some degree or another almost uh, since that time. And ministers were chosen to go out and preach. Here are some representations of some of the churches that were established uh, during this time. Finally, in 1729, 
Alexander Mack and his large group, well over a hundred people, uh, landed in Germantown, Philadelphia. And there you can see uh, Mack and his three boys coming up and greeting Peter Becker and the members of his group. In the meantime, just within the last year or two before this event, uh, one of the new churches, uh, the Conestoga Church, had been having some problems. A young man recently come over from Germany had been baptized and called to the ministry pretty quickly. You remember the name Conrad Beisel. Well now, Beisel had a lot of support for the German Baptist religion, but he also had a lot of his own ideas. And uh, <clears throat> he was a bit hard to get along with. And uh, various members of the German Baptist Church uh, began to move off into Beisel's community. By this time, he had started his own religious activities up at a little village called Ephrata. Uh, and a lot of the German Baptists had begun to move off in that direction. And even though Peter Becker is very happy to meet Mac, I can imagine Peter Becker saying to himself, Boy, I'm sure glad you're here. I can't handle this guy, Beisel. I can just hear him say that. Peter Becker was a rather mild-mannered, uh, not a very assertive man. And so Alexander Mack jumped right into the middle of that, uh, that controversy. And you see the lady to the right who appears to be weeping over the trials and tribulations of the very strong controversy uh, in that community. Christopher Sauer's wife herself had had left the German Baptist Church in Germantown and gone to stay with Beisel's movement. Uh, and a few years later, Alexander Mack's oldest son went with the Beisel movement. So it was very appealing and very attractive to some of the German Baptists. Um, Christopher Sauer uh, at one of the love feasts, he came over just a couple of years later. He knew Alexander Mack in Germany. In fact, he uh, at one time lived in Alexander Mack's house in Schwarzenau, bought it from him. Uh, Christopher Sauer, shown here um, at a love feast, decided to dedicate himself to printing. Uh, about this time also, were the beginnings of efforts to educate children. Now, uh, there's been a continuing argument about whether that should be called Sunday school. Some people like to call that the first Sunday school. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but they did make a special effort through special classes to give special training to children. Now that comes pretty close to a definition of Sunday school, I guess, in my book. Now this was about 40 years before the famous Robert Rake's uh, Sunday school in uh, England. Um, Peter, uh, Christopher Sauer began extensive printing. This is his uh, uh, press. He um, published the Bibles, he published newspapers, he published hymn books. He was the most influential German in the whole colonial America. And he was quite a political force, too. Uh, by about 1750, Christopher Sauer, Jr. and Alexander Mack, Jr. had left the Beisel movement and had dedicated themselves to the church and its leadership. They became very prominent leaders in the next number of decades. Christopher Sauer Jr. took over his father's printing uh, about 1770. The Germantown brethren built the first 
church house, the first building specifically dedicated and devoted to church worship. That's an early view of the Germantown church. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the Germantown church. This little piece now stands as an annex to the bigger Germantown church, but you can still see uh, the structure that was there. Prior to that time, the Germantown people had been meeting occasionally in this little house, which eventually was sold to a brother called by the name of Pettikoffer. Well, after they moved into their new church house, they took the old Pettikoffer home, and that became a house of refuge for widows and orphans. It became the first old folks' home ever in America, ever. And the beginning of the Brethren attention that we pay to children, orphans, widows, and now the retirement homes uh, getting to a lot of us who are still married together, enjoying life in retirement. It all started back there in the Pettikoffer house. The next panel brings us up to about 1775. And you know what happened there, the Revolutionary War. Well, most of the brethren would not fight for either side, the Americans or the British. And that created a problem as to what the other community and townspeople, what do you do with them? They won't fight for anybody. Now, some brethren did... Uh, uh, go to fight. Christopher Sauer Jr. by this time was running the very extensive press. He had uh, a number of children. Two of his sons did join with the British, the Loyalist Party. And that made his family suspect to the patriots of the community. So um, in 1776, maybe a year or two later, I'm not sure the exact, 76 I guess, the uh, American soldiers captured Christopher Sauer Jr. in his home, arrested him, took him on a forced march to a place of internment, tortured him, destroyed much of his copies of books that he had, uh, very cruel treatment. Uh, they did everything but kill him, and uh, some people might have thought about doing that. Well, this persecution by the government was very hard on the German Baptist. And uh, many of the German Baptists of that period thought the best thing for them to do was to leave. They had come to Germantown, Pennsylvania, seeking freedom. Now they didn't have it. So now the best thing after the revolution was to leave. Many of them left and keep a low profile. Stay low. Many of them, as this image shows, went to Virginia under the leadership of uh, Mr. Garber, uh, John Garber. And a lot of them went further west into Ohio, Kentucky, Illinois. Not only did they travel by Conestoga wagons, the Conestoga wagon was so built that uh, if you ran down into a river and the river was too deep, the wagon would float like a boat. Did you ever notice that? But a wagon was small. When they began to set out on the river, the Ohio River for example, they had these huge flat boats which could have been 15 to 20 feet wide and up 40 to 60 feet long. Now that's a huge floating structure. And they had the cabin in there for living. 
Toward the front end of the boat was a stable. You can see a horse sticking his head, you know, just from the front end of the boat there. Here's grandma or mother, whoever, knitting out there in the front. See her spinning wheel. Maybe that's a baby cradle. I don't know. The whole family and all of their possessions floating down the river. Uh, many times they would get off, disembark, say in the neighborhood of uh, the Cincinnati area, and uh, come up kind of in that direction. That's how they got into a lot of this southwestern Ohio. Uh, many went further down and got off on both sides of the river into southern Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, once they got out on land, they could sometimes move by horseback and by wagon uh, a little further. Now, the chief pioneer of the Western movement, that is, into Indiana and Illinois, was George Wolfe. But here on horseback is a man who came in by land, chiefly from the Pittsburgh area, and settled with his followers in northeastern Ohio. George Hoke, H-O-K-E, was the chief elder of the German Baptist in northeastern um, Ohio. So by around 1810, from 1875 to eight, uh, uh, <clears throat> 1775 to 1810, about a 25, 30 year period, the movement out of Pennsylvania, Maryland, south and west, was in pretty much full swing. George Wolfe and his son George Jr. became the most important preachers of the Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois contingent of German Baptists. Now, uh, it's quite appropriate to refer to him as a circuit preacher, circuit rider. We sometimes think that the Methodists were the only ones that had circuit riders, preachers who went around by horseback, but the brethren did it perhaps even before the Methodists did. Uh, George Hoke and now George Wolfe, and uh, not too much beyond this, the guy over there at the end, you probably could guess his name even before I tell you that, John Klein. We had our circuit riders for half a century or more in the pioneer area. Now, uh, the brethren in Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois were not in very close contact with the brethren out east. Believe it or not, they didn't have computers and the internet. They didn't even have telephone. They didn't even have mail that would get there within less than a half a year. So they were out of touch with the Eastern Brethren. Now every place you go, and all of us do this, we fraternize with our neighbors, and if they're religious, we talk about stuff, and we maybe pick up ideas from them, they pick up ideas from us. Well, the Brethren in Kentucky and Indiana were doing some things a little differently than the Brethren out in Pennsylvania. And when they were able to get in communication, the brethren in Pennsylvania, the eastern brethren, were a little unhappy with the western brethren. In fact, back then they were the far western brethren. They weren't just west, they were far west, way out in Kentucky and Indiana. And uh, for a long time, there was considerable argument between the Eastern Brethren and the Western Brethren. And to make a long story short, uh, the annual conference, which was at that time under the control of the Eastern Brethren, finally just took an action that in one fell swoop, about 1,500 Brethren were kicked off of the books. And along with that, perhaps 20 to 30 congregations now, they weren't wiped off the face of the earth. They just affiliated with other denominations. Uh, but we've lost them in terms of our history up until just uh, pretty recently. 
But uh, the Eastern Brethren kept on working with the Western Brethren. And finally, uh, there was some reconciliation and further division was uh, avoided. Uh, Adam Payne, a preacher to the Indians, northern Illinois, and he is supposed to have spoken at a rally or a tribal meeting where the Indians were all set to declare war on some white communities in northern Illinois. And he's supposed to have kind of persuaded them not to uh, start another war. Um, Jacob Leatherman, the walking preacher. Medford says he's never known to ride a horse. Now, probably he did, but nobody ever made any notes about it. But they talked about his walking. And part of the tradition is that he may have walked in his lifetime, somebody said, 20,000 miles. Um, along about this time, Sunday schools were coming back in vogue. The impetus for Sunday schools came from um, national Sunday school conventions, not brethren. And so the first pressure to have Sunday schools was non-brethren pressure. And the brethren of the 18th century weren't sure they liked it. Many times they argued against Sunday schools. When Sunday schools were first started, they were held in houses. Uh, but by the end of the century, uh, Sunday schools were well established uh, in the Brethren churches. Uh, in the background, symbolically again, is the emergence of uh, larger conference bodies and the standing committees. Sarah Major, who came from the east and moved uh, out here to this area of Ohio, the first uh, woman preacher. We didn't have provisions to license women to preach, but she did anyhow. <laughs> and uh, the very brethren who would have refused to license an ordainer were among the first ones to come and listen to her preach. So a bit of an irony there. Um, she spoke at an annual conference in 17... 78 out in North Manchester. And then the most famous character of this phase of, of the church history was John Klein from down in Virginia, and you know a great deal about his uh, story. Quick, do you know the name of his horse? No. Oh, you got it right on. <laughs> Um, 1851, the awakening of the church, according to Medford's terminology. <clears throat> and uh, in this period of time, a number of scenes in the front are important to point out. Henry Kirch, a German minister in the Lutheran church, dissatisfied with his Lutheran religion. And they were equally dissatisfied with him. In fact, they locked his church and he couldn't get in. <laughs> Left the Pittsburgh area and came to Ohio where he was baptized into the German Baptist by Elder Hoke, already mentioned. And Kurtz was a scholarly sort of a man. He liked to write. A couple of times he tried to get a magazine started and it didn't work. Finally, in 1851, he floated a trial issue, the Gospel Visitor, and finally the annual conference said, well, we'll try it and see if, if nothing happens, why it may be okay. So the unbroken tradition of printing, which eventually then produced uh, a number of magazines uh, around the uh, 
denomination then. The emergence of the early schools. Now these schools back then were sometimes referred to as seminaries or academies. Now they, the seminary back in this period of time was not a theological seminary. It was just another name given for what would amount to about uh, ninth or 10th grade, just plain education. Eight years of study was kind of the limit to the public schools. And in order to teach, you had to know more than the students, so you had to take something a little bit beyond that. And that's what these seminaries were for. Um, some of these early seminaries, uh, Cedar Grove Seminary in Broadway, Virginia. And there again, John Klein, he was one of the supporters of that program. The Kishikokuya Seminary in Pennsylvania, S.C. Sharp. And the New Vienna Academy, that's down here not far from where you're at now, with James Quinter, uh, 1861. In the background, this white bearded man, symbolic, David Leedy, one of the first uh, ministers out in Oregon. And then coming up here with the Civil War sweeping over the Brotherhood, uh, Medford has a lot of symbolism in there. He portrays war as the work of the devil. And he got the devil right in the middle of this black cloud, including his horns. You see that? Now that's Medford's personal view that Satan has horns, and that may be what he thought he looked like at that time. Um, after the war came more schools. Uh, Salem College in Indiana. Uh, Burnettsville Normal. Back up here, J.G. Royer started that one. Plum Creek Normal in Pennsylvania. All of these people are real persons. You'll have to read through the book to get their name. Here's the uh, first official college level group. Zook, Broomball, Quinter, and Ellis. Quinter was uh, eventually a, a president, editor of the Gospel Messenger. He died at an annual conference in 1888 in North Manchester. Uh, soon succeeded by C.C. C. Ellis, uh, a very uh, prominent churchman. C.C. C. Ellis's son, Calvert Ellis, is shown here receiving the uh, gavel from Rufus Bowman at the annual conference in Orlando in 1947. This seemed as good a place as any to stick in a picture of M.G. Broomball, governor of Pennsylvania, twice president of Junietta College. You know all about his history and uh, background. The uh, Next panel goes more into detail with our colleges. Uh, this particular panel is just loaded with people and they're all named, identified. 26 people named in this scene, plus uh, six different schools and colleges and the beginnings of the uh, work in India. Uh, the Mount Morris College. Um, Brethren bought that from another denomination and here are some of the, uh, one of the famous uh, leaders of Mount Morris, D.L. Miller. It's not by mistake that they have him holding the world. He was pretty well to do. Um, his business was as a wholesale grocer and he made lots of money that way. And he traveled around the world. He took his brother with him who took pictures and he published half a dozen books of his world travels. One of them was called Circling the Globe. Another one, Travels in Bible Land, and four or five others. And the brethren from about uh, 1890 for the next 30 years or so just ate up his books by the thousands. Um, J.G. Royer, another president. And then uh, comes into... Um, <clears throat> 
Ashland College uh, with S.G. Sharp and R.H. Miller was once a president of Ashland College. And here is uh, <clears throat> uh, Bridgewater College and uh, some of the leaders of Bridgewater. Let's see, D.C. Flory, Walter Yount, Paul Bowman. He's the first uh, beardless man we've seen for quite a while. Uh, was president for many, many years. Um, so um, the college were beginning to uh, come on the scene. Um, this set of three figures, this one and this one, and uh, this one represents Peter Need, D.P. Saylor, and H.R. Holsinger, and uh, symbolizes the great struggle that we had in the 1880s when the brethren were of such diverse uh, viewpoints that they thought it better perhaps to um, have some separate structures. Um, Daleville College, INH Beam, and uh, this is McPherson College, uh, D.W. Kurtz, one of the more modern men from that period. Um, here is R.H. Miller, I had him identified wrong in the other scene. Laverne College, the more recent one, uh, uh, C. Ernest Davis, and here are the beginnings of the mission work in India with Wilbur Stover and uh, Primchant P. Bugat, Primchant Bugat. I think he may have been the first person baptized in India. In 1950, Primchant Bugat, then the leading elder of the Indian church, visited a number of the brethren in America in 1950. I remember uh, seeing him then. This uh, has to do with uh, the local connection. We have more colleges. This is Manchester, uh, 18, uh, um, 1895 when E.S. Young started the college. And among the various presidents, Otho Winger and Vernon Swam. L.D. Eikenberry, I.D. Parker, and uh, Elizabethtown College, again the more younger member, A.C. Balker. Um, this scene symbolizes the role of the church um, in, the, uh, in his estimation. The artist represents the publishing interest as the veins of the church with the local church as the heart and the seminary as the arteries. That's an interesting figure there. Uh, and so the publishing interest up near the top and the local church with two symbolic pastors by the... Uh, by around 1900 to 1930, many rural churches were still strong, but a number of urban churches were also uh, uh, coming into the scenes. Uh, Moyne Landis is kind of representative of the rural pastors, uh, Malin Brower as an urban pastor. The seminary. Uh, you'll recognize Rufus Bowman, perhaps, and down at the bottom, uh, William Beam. Um, <clears throat> he was one of the old men I knew when I was a very young man. And at Camp Mac one summer, William Beam and I were sitting on a bench, and he was the one that uh, asked me if I wouldn't consider becoming a minister. So that's where I got my call through William Beam uh, there at camp. Um, you see the 
railroad and the mountains, symbolic of the brethren moving toward the west. These are people from the, uh, the Pacific Coast, Sanger and Peters. And the Chinese mission about 1908, Frank Crumpacker is a name that stands out there. And two Chinese leaders, Pastor Yin and Moi Guang. Moi Guang was a, the first uh, Chinese graduate of Manchester College. Um, panel 10, the beginnings of the overhead organization of the church. And here we're pretty much concentrating on the Church of the Brethren phase of it. The beginnings of church committees and uh, ladies' aid, sisters' aid meetings. Um, what, what are they doing at an aid meeting? Well, what else? They're quilting. And uh, if we had all of the hours of all of the women who've ever met in aid meetings making quilts, wouldn't that be a whale of a period of time? <laughs> um, the uh, uh, General Education Board and the Sunday School Board, uh, all of these people are named. And uh, <clears throat> this shows symbolically World War One. Notice that wave sweeping over the church. When I studied that image, <clears throat> the thing that came to my mind was tsunami. You know what a tsunami is, a giant wave. Just an ordinary wave wouldn't be afraid of. But uh, this is certainly a tsunami sweeping over the church in 1915, 16, 17. And uh, among the people in the church who pondered and wanted to know what to do, what do we do, some of the church members forsook the church and left. But here's a good brother with his hand resting on the church that said, I'm with the church. And during World War I, um, a number of our men resisted military service and they were consequently uh, put in prisons or assigned uh, forced labor of one sort or another. Um, this brings us up to the annual conference of 1919, the first post-war annual conference. And right after a war, the brethren gathered with real enthusiasm to carry out the work of the church. And uh, this great conference held at Winona Lake, um, they had a couple of interesting song leaders back then in 1919. You know this guy? William Beery. And this lady who was one of the most powerful song leaders we ever had. Who was it? Sadie Wampler. Sadie Stutzman Wampler. She was the inspiration for Alvin Brightbill as a young man to go into song leading. Now that's not generally known. Uh, we think of Sadie as a director of plays, a drama teacher. She was. But uh, way before my time, she was the most powerful song leader at annual conferences. Uh, this is filled with uh, images of the people at that annual conference and uh, uh, what, what they did and uh, uh, actions that they took, uh, starting education programs. Out of that came our mission work in Africa, 1923 to 24. Um, H. Dover Culp. Um, so always there was a uh, uh, strong reaction after a war 
when the brethren set about relief and reconciliation, recovery. Now in this panel, which takes us up to about uh, the middle 20s, three things are happening. First, the origins of the youth program in the Church of the Brethren, the tragedy of the war, and the immediate post-war relief and reconciliation era. It was a small church in Monticello, Indiana that sent a query to annual conference in 1904. Is it all right if we have young people's meetings in the church? And conference agreed. And that was the start of the official denominational uh, emphasis on young people. Among the young people's programs was summer camps. Uh, the camp out in Nebraska, beginning as early as 1916, L.W. Schultz and the Camp Mac, uh, 1925. This was um, uh, Camp Harmony in Pennsylvania, 1924. And this is Camp Bethel in Virginia, 1927. This shows at least what for us in this Midwest was a typical youth campfire with Dan West leading discussions and Alvin Bright Bill leading singing. Again, the tides of war, 1939, up to 1945. Those of us, all of us lived through it. August 6, 1945 with that well-known mushroom cloud of the atom bomb. I was working the whole summer at Camp Mac. <clears throat> And L.W. Schultz would go in every morning to Milford and get the Chicago newspaper. He did that every day. And I can remember reading that issue in August of 1945 about the atom bomb. Anybody ever ask you where you were on August the 6th, 1945, when you first heard about the atom bomb? Maybe you don't remember, but, but I do, of a camp reading this newspaper. Well, the brethren, from the time the war started, almost before it got started, the brethren were trying to collect food and clothing for relief. And in 1940, the brethren around northern Indiana collected tons of relief clothing, piled it all up in front of the Quinter Miller Auditorium. There's the Good Shepherd window at the Quinter Miller Auditorium. And in 1940, July 4th, that shipment of relief goods uh, left uh, northern Indiana. Um, this symbolizes the first boatload of heifers. Uh, the story of the heifers, uh, uh, some went to Puerto Rico. We couldn't get in every place in Europe. It wasn't until about 1945 that we began to get some in Poland. Uh, it wasn't until about 1949 that we finally were able to get them into Germany. Um, you see that little stick figure down near the bottom? That's Dan West sitting under a tree when he first thought about the heifers for relief. An artist can slip in all sorts of things. <laughs> and in a sea of plentiful dollars and coins were countless starving children. 1946 saw the beginnings of our General Brotherhood Board and uh, they were trying to figure out what to do here. That brings us up to 1948, and that was about the situation at that time. 
And Medford then painted his vision for the future. 1949 to 2008. And I remember thinking back then, gee, 2008, that's way off in the future. <laughs> well, here we are. Uh, his dream for the future. And he portrayed it with a young couple and their child. I always thought that he had me and my girlfriend in mind when he painted that one, I'm not sure. But, uh, <laughs> we didn't have a little girl then, we did shortly. And uh, they're pointing to the left. This is the kind of, what kind of a future will we have? What will we see in our church in the future? And then in 2008, an elderly couple, looking back over what they've just been through, wondering what life has been like. Well, this is Medford's view of um, the church. 60 years, not quite 60, but leading up to this very year. Symbolized by the truths of the love feast table, There's probably no place better than this where we demonstrate the brotherhood of mankind. And we see people of all races gathered around the table. All ages. Notice the people washing the feet, different races. I think one could study that picture for a long time and what, what did he envision us to be? Have we become that kind of a church? The more I look at this, the more I'm really impressed with Medford's insights into what he would wish for his church. How close have we come to these ideals, these goals? Thank you.